the book of Romans in chapter 5. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for the privilege that we have to be able to meet together in this place. Thank you for each one who's come. Lord, as we look into your word now, we pray that your Holy Spirit would have freedom and liberty to work and to move in our midst. Lord, I pray that you would help me as I speak. I pray that you would forgive me of every sin and empty me of myself, fill me with your Holy Spirit that I might speak clearly and plainly the message for this hour. And Lord, I pray that the hearts of these people would be open and receptive to what you would have for them today as well. May you be honored and glorified in the decisions that are made this day. As a result of hearing your word, we ask in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake, amen. Military history is filled with accounts of soldiers who have literally fallen on a grenade, as the saying goes. They have willingly fallen on a grenade to save the lives of others. As you can well imagine, the term refers to a deliberate act of a person using their body to cover a grenade, absorbing the explosion absorbing the fragmentation of that grenade into their own body in order that they might save the life of others. That's what it means, falling, falling on a grenade. Obviously, it's a heroic act. It's a selfless act. In fact, in U.S. military history, more citations for the Medal of Honor have been awarded to soldiers who willingly fell on a grenade than any other single act of heroism, falling on the grenade. I'll give you an example. A PFC Garfield McConnell Langhorn, a 20-year-old soldier in Vietnam while serving in the U.S. Army, on the 15th of January, 1969, was involved in a, a terrible firefight with enemy soldiers. During the battle, an enemy hand grenade landed near him and, and also to some wounded men that he was trying to give aid to. And when the Medal of Honor was then awarded to his parents, when the Medal of Honor was presented to his parents, the citation for the medal was read, and, and the citation said this, and I quote, Choosing to protect these wounded, he unhesitatingly threw himself on the grenade scooped it beneath his body and absorbed the blast by sacrificing himself he saved the lives of his comrades the lord jesus gave an even higher honor to such an action here's what the lord jesus said about it in john chapter 15 and verse number 13 greater love hath no man than this than that a man lay down his life for his friends. But this morning I want to talk to you not about the love of men, I want to talk to you about the love of God. I want to talk to you about the love of God, and as we consider the love of God, I want you to immediately understand and recognize that His, his love is far greater than what we have just spoken about. His love is far greater than that because you see, when Jesus Christ gave His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die on the cross of Calvary, He did not give His Son to die for His friends. He gave His Son to die for His enemies. He gave His Son to die for those who had rejected Him, those who, who mocked Him, those, re, who, those who refused to acknowledge Him. That's who He came to die for. He came to die for lost, wicked sinners. Now you remember in our study together last time we saw the Apostle Paul as he was focusing on the benefits that are ours because of the grace of God. The benefits that we have because of God's amazing grace. How that God in His amazing grace has judiciously declared wicked sinful men who have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. He has declared them to be justified. In other words, in the eyes of God, they are able to stand before God and be viewed just as though they had never sinned. That's what justification is. And, and so this is the wonderful thing that God has provided for us. But then the question, the question begs to be asked, why? Why would God do that? 
Why would God make such a provision? And in our text today, the Apostle Paul is going to reveal the reason by pointing out three key points. And it's these three points that I want us to notice together. Number one, I want us to notice God's view. God's view. As we've come through this book so far, the Apostle Paul has made it painfully clear that all men, Jew, Gentile, regardless of your race, the color of your skin, the language you speak, the nation you come from, uh, God has made it very clear through the Apostle Paul that all of us are pretty much in the same boat. We are all sinners. We're all sinners. You remember the statement we saw back in chapter 3, verse number 22 and verse number 23. The Apostle Paul declared there is no difference. There's no, di no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. We're all the same. There is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And now the Apostle Paul expands on that spiritual truth and he's going to do it by declaring a couple of things. First of all, he's going to declare how that we were weak. We were weak. In Romans chapter 5, verse number 6, he says this, We were yet without strength. We were yet without strength. The word used here is usually applied to those who are sick. It's a term that is used for those who are feeble. Uh, those who have no strength in themselves. All of, the, all of the strength that they have has been taken away from them by the disease that has infected them. And that's the very point the Apostle Paul is making here. The disease of sin has infected all men and has robbed us of any strength. It has robbed us of any ability to justify ourselves in the sight of God or to save ourselves from the eternal wrath of God. We are weak. We have no strength. The sickness of sin and the depravity of sin has robbed us of any ability to save ourselves or to earn or to merit our salvation. We're weak. Not only does the Apostle Paul declare that we are weak, notice also in verse number 6, we were ungodly. We were ungodly. Verse number 6 tells us that we were yet ungodly. Godly. The word ungodly simply means that we were living our life as though God did not even exist. We pay no attention to His Word. We pay no attention to His commandments. We live our life. We make our decisions. And we never give a thought about God. By the way, if you'll remember a couple of Sundays ago, we talked in the book of Psalms in the Sunday school hour. We talked about the practical atheist. How that even sometimes Christian people, even Christian people can be guilty of this. E even Christian people can live their life, and, and even though they know God, they have a relationship with God, yet, yet they live their life as if there is no God. They make their own choices, their own decisions, follow their own plans, their own dreams, their own ambitions, never one time stopping to seek what God's will for them might be. They're a practical atheist. A practical atheist. And the word ungodly, that's the very idea that it carries. It means to live life as if God does not exist. In other words, not only, not only were we incapable of living for God, we really have no desire naturally to do that. We have no desire to live for Him. And again, this can be true of unsaved and saved. And so we need to be careful that we guard our hearts, that we always seek to put God first and to do what He would have for us to do. We were ungodly. We were ungodly. And certainly from God's point of view, there's absolutely nothing to be found in any of us that is flattering. We, we like to pat ourselves on the back and talk about how good we are, but that's only because we're looking at ourselves through our own glasses when we begin to look at ourselves through God's eyes, the, the tragic reality becomes crystal clear. There, there's nothing flattering in any of us. There's nothing good in any of us. 
Everything that we have is given by His grace because none of us deserve His loving kindness. And yet notice what it says in verse number 6, that when we were yet without strength, in due time, the very time in history that the Lord God appointed it to be so, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. He died for the ungodly. That's the same truth we find so clearly stated in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 and verse number 5, when the fullness of time was come. In other words, right on schedule with God's timetable. God had it all orchestrated from the beginning of time. He had it all laid out. The when, the where, the how. And in the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law. Why did He do it? To redeem them that were under the law. That we might receive the adoption of of sons that wonderful truth that wonderful truth concerning God's view of things brings us then to the second point which is God's grace God's grace as we consider this point two things that we find mentioned in the text the first one would be the human observation the human observation now if we honestly think about it I think we would all agree that in this world of nearly 8 billion people, uh, I, went on the, uh, I went on this website called the World Population Clock. Have you, have you seen that website? You know, take a look at it. it. It's amazing. I mean, it's just doing this like here. You could almost turn it on and use it as a fan. I mean, the numbers are going so fast. And that's how the population of our world is growing. And, and we're very quickly coming to 8 billion people. And if you stop and think about it, of all these 8 billion people in the world today, I, I dare to say that there are not very many of them that we would be willing to die for. W would you agree? I mean, you know, you, you just look around. Now, not very many people. Uh, don't look around in here, okay, but I mean, you know, outside. Uh, not, not many people that we would be willing, that we would be willing to die. C certainly, certainly, uh, we would be willing to die for our parents, I think. You know, I think we'd be willing to do that. Be, be willing to die for our spouse if she didn't kill us first. And uh, be willing to die for our spouse. Or, or, or be willing to die maybe for our children, even though we'd like to kill them sometimes, right? And, and so, you know, there are certain people that we know that we're acquainted with, certain people that we would, that we would be willing to die for. But in reality, if we're honest, outside of our family circle, Probably not very many. In fact, probably very few that we would be willing to give our life without a moment's hesitation. And that's the observation the Apostle Paul is going to make in our text. That's the observation he's going to make in our text. He's going to, he's going to basically divide all of humanity into two groups. He's going to divide all of humanity into two groups. First of all, he's going to talk about the righteous man. The righteous man. Uh, verse number 7 of chapter 5. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Now when it says a righteous man, I want you to understand. He's not talking about a man who has been saved. He's not talking about a man who's been born again. Rather, this is a man, whether he's saved or unsaved, doesn't matter. This is a man who is distinguished by the integrity of his conduct. In other words, this is just a good man. It's the kind of guy you don't mind doing business with. Because you know he's honest. You know he's upright in his dealings. And, and, and he's, just, he's, just a righteous, he's just a righteous guy. In other words, this is a man who lives a good life. He lives a clean life, a moral life, honest life. And, and yet, in spite of that, he is coldly and arrogantly aloof. In other words, he's like those Jewish Pharisees who viewed themselves as being superior to everybody else and never wanted to be risking to be defiled by, by other people. He, he's righteous, he's good, moral, just not real friendly. Not, not the kind of guy that you, would, that you would like to hang out with. 
And so therefore, as much as we may admire that man, as much as we may applaud that man, look to him as being a good example for doing right, yet we do not find in him any characteristic of Christian kindness. There, there's no real characteristic of Christian friendship or Christian love that would cause us to even consider wanting to lay down our life and die for him. You get what I'm saying? That's the righteous man. Not only does the Apostle Paul speak of the righteous man, nobody wants to die for this guy. Even though he's righteous, nobody wants to die for a righteous jerk. And so, so then he goes to the other side, talks about the good man. The good man. Verse number 7, Yet peradventure, okay, no, some might die for scarcely, scarcely, not very often, some might die for a righteous, and, and yet peradventure for a good man maybe. Perhaps for a good man, some would even dare to die. Again, this is not necessarily talking about a saved person. Uh, rather, this is a man, whether he's saved or unsaved, who is distinguished by the integrity, not of his character, but of his conduct. His conduct. But that's not all. He also displays characteristics of Christian kindness. You, you know, some of the kindest people I've ever met have been people who were not Christians. It's true. You, you, you agree? You, you've met them too, right? Yeah. Some of the kindest people I've ever met. I, I mean, when it comes to being kind and gracious and all of that, they're more Christian than some Christians I know. And, and they're just as lost as they can be. And, and so this is talking about a good man. He's, he's gracious. He's merciful. He's cordial. He's benevolent. He's loving. He's likable. He's gentle. All, all of these characteristics of Christian conduct. And, and for a person like that, even though he may not even be saved, yet we, we, we might perhaps be willing to die for them. To die for them. Now, that's the understanding on the human level. That's the understanding on the human level. But now I want you to notice the divine action. The divine action. You remember the Lord Jesus said back in John chapter 3, verse number 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And now the Apostle Paul is going to declare that even, even when we were weak, even when we were ungodly, even in that condition, when there was absolutely nothing in us that deserved anything other than God's holy judgment, while we're in that condition, I want you to notice, Paul writes in verse number 8, that God commendeth. Simply means He showed. He proved. He demonstrated. He put on display. He commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, without strength, ungodly, Christ died for us. That's why the Apostle John wrote in 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, Hereby perceive we the love of God. We're able to comprehend, we're able to understand, we're able to recognize the reality of the love of God. How do we recognize it? Because of the fact that He laid down His life for us. That's how we do it. He laid down His life for us. And because of the price that Jesus Christ paid on the cross of Calvary for our sin, the sin debt that rightfully belongs to us, He took it upon Himself. He paid our penalty. He died in our place. And because of that wonderful reality, we have now been made to be the recipients of God's generosity, number three. God's generosity. The Apostle Paul is now going to reveal the gracious generosity of God by mentioning four things that Jesus Christ has freely provided for us. Three things, we don't deserve them, but three things that have been freely provided for us. The first one is justification. 
justification. Chapter 5, verse 9, much more than being now justified by his blood. Now, we've talked about this before. The Apostle Paul mentions it again to remind us that this thing of justification, this thing of justification that we have, it is, it is available only through the salvation that we receive from the Lord Jesus Christ. That, that's the only way it can be obtained. It's only through what Jesus Christ did for us. And, and when we receive Christ as our Savior, then we are declared righteous before God. When we repent of our sin, we trust in Christ. And at that very moment, the sinless righteousness, the perfect righteousness of Christ is imputed to us. It is placed on our account. And we are no longer viewed as guilty. We're no longer viewed as condemned in the eyes of a holy God. But but rather, when he looks at us, as I said before, it is just as though we never sinned. That's justification. That's justification. Not only is there justification, but because of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross of Calvary, there is also reconciliation. There is reconciliation. The word simply means to take enemies and turn them into friends. That's what reconciliation is. Reconciliation is when a mediator comes between two who are opposed to one another. Two who are at odds with one another. And he comes between and he takes the hand of one, takes the hand of the other, and he brings them together and makes those two enemies to become two friends. That's what reconciliation means. Now let me remind you of the words of the psalmist. In Psalm 7 and verse number 11, the Bible says that God is angry with the wicked every day. God is angry with the wicked every day. Albert Barnes, in his commentary, wrote this. He said, it means that God's nature, God's laws, God's government, God's feelings are all arrayed against the wicked but he cannot regard the conduct of the wicked with favor and therefore he will punish them he will punish them however when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ notice what it says in verse number nine much more than we shall be saved from wrath through him through Jesus Christ, we are freed, we are saved from the wrath, the anger, the judgment of a holy God because of our sin. When we put our faith and trust in Him, we are delivered. In other words, it's like, it's like Jesus Christ comes between the holiness of God the Father and the wickedness of me and the wickedness of you. And He comes between and with His own blood, He makes there to be a reconciliation. A reconciliation. In other words, God calls a truce. The flags of battle are put away. He's no longer at war with us. Rather, rather, as we saw back in chapter 5 and verse number 1, the very beginning of the chapter, you remember what it said? Being justified by faith. What do we have? Now we have peace with God. No longer enemies. No longer at war. Now we have peace. We've been reconciled. Been reconciled. There's justification, reconciliation. There's a third thing that we have as a result of the salvation that Jesus Christ died to secure for us. And that is preservation. Preservation. Romans chapter 5, verse number 10. Notice what it says. It says, For if, when we were enemies... We were reconciled to God by the death of His Son much more. In other words, you think that's good. Listen to what's coming now. Much more. Being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. One writer has well noted, if His weakness at Calvary was sufficient to reconcile us, how much more shall the full, vigorous powers of our resurrected Savior be sufficient to keep us eternally secure? That's the protection that we have. 
If by His death, He's able to reconcile us, to redeem us, to save us from the penalty of our sin, how much more as a living Savior, seated at the right hand of the throne on high, as our living Savior, how much more, how much more is He able to keep us? And He's able to do it. Because here's why. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, He ever lives to make intercession for us. He ever lives to make intercession for us. There's the justification. There's the reconciliation. There's the preservation. And I, I want you to notice there is the communication. In chapter 5, verse 11, the Apostle Paul wrote this, And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. In other words, we who were once at enmity with God, we who were once His enemies, we were at war with God. Because of our sin, there was nothing in us that deserved anything but God's wrath, God's anger, God's judgment. And yet, because of what Jesus Christ accomplished for us, the anger, the wrath, the warring, the fighting, it's all now been replaced. Notice it. It's been replaced by a joy. It's been replaced by a joy that we have in God through, not because of anything we've done, but it's through the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, the psalmist, I think, said it very well when he said that as people who are trusting in the Lord God, we can enter into His gates. The idea is we literally come into His presence. We're able to come into His gates and we're able to come. We're able to come with thanksgiving. And we're able to come into His courts. We're, we're able to go into the very courtroom of God, if you will. Now, I've visited a courtroom and it was quite interesting for me because I hadn't been convicted of anything. It's not because I was innocent, they just hadn't caught me yet. Okay, But I visited a courtroom and I was able to kind of look around and it was, it was actually quite interesting. And, and, but I, I cannot help but imagine how different it would be had I been arrested, convicted of a crime, and brought into the courtroom as a criminal. Not a tourist, a criminal. Can you imagine how different it would be? How different it would be? And yet because of what Jesus Christ has done for us, we're able to come into His courts. We're able to come into His presence. We're able to come with joy. We're able to come with thanksgiving. We're able to come with praise. Because Jesus Christ has opened the way. Jesus Christ, through the death that He suffered for us on the cross of Calvary, and the blood that was shed, He has cleansed us from our sin. He has justified us. He has taken the righteousness of Christ and imputed that to our account. We are now righteous, not because of who we are or what we did, but because of what Jesus Christ did for us. I never cease to be amazed. I never cease to be thankful for the great salvation that God has so graciously given to me. And I'll be honest with you, I, I don't deserve any good thing from God. I don't. I don't deserve any good thing from God, and yet God in His gracious mercy has freely given this wonderful gift of salvation. And you know what? He loves me more than He loves you, right? No. <laughs> that, that's, that's a good time to say no. Okay. No, the truth of the matter is He loves all of us the same. And, and, and what God did for me and what God has given to me, he, He'll do for anybody. He'll do for anybody if they'll just put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. If they will be willing to humble themselves confessing their sin, acknowledging that Christ is their only hope of heaven, and if they will receive that gift that has been provided for them, what God has done for me and many of you, He'll do for everyone. And anyone. There's none so wicked that God cannot save. None so vile that God cannot cleanse. God's love is for all men. And His desire is that all men might be saved. And so my sincere prayer this morning as we think about these things together 
My sincere prayer is that every one of us who have been saved, Every one of us who know Jesus Christ as our Savior, we have, we have received that salvation that God so graciously has provided and so graciously has given. That every one of us, as we consider, as we consider the price that was paid and, and, and the gift that has been given, that, that every one of us will, will, will simply do as we're commanded in the book of 1 John chapter 4, verse number 19, that we will love Him because He first loved us. That, that we'll reciprocate that love as we consider how great His love is toward us. That it will make us love Him more. Make us love Him more. And that we'll demonstrate the reality of our love. Not just by talking about how much we love the Lord or singing songs like, Oh, how I love Jesus. But that we'll show the reality of our love for Him in the way that we obey Him, in the way that we worship Him, in the way that we keep His commandments. You remember what Jesus said? Jesus said those who really love Him are the ones who obey His words. And those who don't obey His words, no matter how much they may talk about it, they really don't love the Lord. May God help our love to be sincere. May God help our love to be real. And, and for those who this morning, perhaps you, you've not yet trusted in Christ as your Savior. You do not know for sure if you were to die today that heaven would be your home. I just want to tell you this morning that if you will turn to Jesus Christ, if you will repent of the fact, acknowledge the fact that you have sinned against God, you, you've broken His laws, you've offended His holiness, and, and if you will acknowledge that before God, and if you will ask Him to save you on the authority of God's Word, I can promise you this morning, that's exactly what He will do. He will give to you that wonderful gift of God, which is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And it's not something you have to work for. It's not something you have to try to earn. It's a free gift that has already been bought and paid for in full. When Jesus Christ took your sin, died in your place, paid the price, and then said, it is finished. Transaction's done. Nothing more needs to be accomplished. Jesus paid it all. And all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but He washed it white as snow. If you know Him this morning, let's love Him. Let's praise Him. Let's serve Him the way we should. He's certainly worthy of that. And if you don't know Him, I hope that you'll trust Him. 